I am Sibusi Sofilane, South Africa's greatest mountaineer, and I've just done the podcast or interview with uh, Sarah Kumalo uh, under the topic because it is there. Well, it was famously uh, popularized by yesterday mountaineers, um, Mallory, and it's purely the same reason. Well, we we don't do it for anything really. We we go and stretch ourselves because because we want to, uh, because we have life, and because the world is so vast and with so great opportunities. We all have extraordinary abilities, and we all are extraordinary human beings. So yes, having done um, the interview, I just feel excited that um, people out there are able to realize their full potential now. And I really appreciate the opportunity that I've just been given by Sarah, where I shared from coming from my the Bushveld in St. Rural South Africa and Swaziland to standing to the top of Mount Everest in 2003 and again in 2005, where I didn't really have an interest to climb mountains when I was young. But it's exactly the same reason why it put, this podcast resonates well with me. We do it because it is there. We do it because we want to inspire people. We want to inspire a generation that has no limits because it is not where you come from. It is not where you are born. It is not who you are. It is what is it that you want to do with the life that you have. And therefore it's a question of why stop when you realize, when you know that you've got so much to offer the world. So yes, um, this is me. I am Sibu Sinso Vilane. I'm very grateful and humbled to have done the interview with Sarah Kumalo. Thank you. Because It's There with Sarah Kumalo is proudly sponsored by Vuma. In a world of possibilities, our choices define who we are. We can choose to simply get things done, but we choose to make a difference. We can choose to go far, or we can choose to go further. We choose great over good every time, because we can. And because we can, we must. We don't just act, we activate. When we move, we move forward. Instead of simply providing access, we see the potential for success. Because where others see data, we see dreams. To us, connecting means more than plugs and ports. We exist to empower ordinary people to do extraordinary things. We aim higher and we choose to do more. We don't wait for opportunities. We create them. Our choices define us. And when faced with the choice, we always choose. Extraordinary. Sovelane, welcome to Because It's There, and thank you so much for giving us your time um, for this hour so that our viewers can get into your headspace. Who is Sibusi Sovelane? What is he about, and how does he go about this endurance thing? And the title is The Playbook of Endurance in Because It's There. Mr. Vilani, how are you doing? And welcome to Because It's There. I'm doing very, very well indeed, and thank you very much for having me. I, I appreciate the opportunity. I'm so excited and so looking forward to chatting and talking about Because It Is There. That's a very interesting one by Mallory. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the whole point. It's really about why bother be great? Why bother be a leader? Because it's there. Because in spite of all our insecurities, where we come from, a boy heading ship, you too can be a leader. You can step on top of the world. So, because it's there. Anyway, so let's start with a little bit of an icebreaker. I believe in the philosophy of no limits because you need to finish that sentence. Oh, yes. Uh, no limits because every human being is born with very unlimited potential. And that is my sole belief. I don't believe in, in this thing that the sky is the limit. 
I believe that the person is the limit. Yeah. Uh, up until this, this stage where they, re they realize that only themselves can stop themselves from achieving anything. When I say anything, I mean anything, really, um, that a person wants to try and pursue. And it has, that statement has been informed by my own um, experiences uh, where I had gone and did things that I, even though I believed I could do them, but I, I never thought I could do them. And then it was when those things stretched me to, to realize that I have so, such potential that I have no limits except the ones I impose or set for myself, which are some of those limitations are actually um, conditioned to us. And, 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 and it depends on environment or a lot of things. Others, other limitations are imposed by people, but it takes the individual themselves to identify with the fact that they are limitless and as such, they can go as far as they think and believe they can. Absolutely. So it's limiting beliefs that stops us from being great sometimes. So you absolutely. It, oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's, that's that because the biggest thing is, is about belief. And I believe that we all are determined to, to do stuff when we have the self belief within us. I think that's where it will start. Uh, I always say to people, um, you may you may feel that you may have the resources to do stuff, uh, being material resources, be it finances, be it support from other people. But if that inner resource, which is self-belief, is never there, all the outside resources will never serve you any purpose. Mm -hmm. But the biggest of them all, you must have the inner will, the inner drive, the inner belief that you that by nature you have got your natural abilities, your capabilities your God-given talents to achieve like anybody else can, and only then you unlock this unlimited potential to go as far as you can ever think you can go where not many people would even think that a human being can get there. Absolutely. Wow, let's get into the real myth of Mr. Velani. You are depicted as the man of many firsts, the first black man to summit Everest, the first black person to summit on both the North and the South side, the first black person to ski to the South Pole, the North Pole, uh, you know, complete the Explorer Grand Slam, which only 70 people in the world have done. Have you at any point in your career reflected on the meaning of being first? or a pioneer as rolled out by the media coverage of you, Mr. Villan, what conclusion have you reached in that reflect, as, as you reflect on this? It, well, it took me a long time to, to align with being, a, being first. Um, and I will, I will share how it came about. When, when John Doble, my British friend, um, decided to talk to me about climbing Everest, he went a step further, which I wasn't. We went a step further to try and, and, and find out if any, any other black person from anywhere in the world had climbed Everest. And, and obviously, you will know that it was Elizabeth Hollywood to uh, have all the data and all the records. And she, John wrote to Elizabeth, and then she, re she replied back saying, well, um, I don't think any black person from anywhere in the world had ever as ascended or attempted a Himalayan mountain. And when we got that reply, I had already been to Pokaldi and Island Peak, which were not recorded because we never even bought that. I just uh, um, went uh, quietly because I thought that then I was going to be uh, allowed to join an Everest expedition based on that trip. But I didn't make any publicity about it because I thought, well, with my inexperience coming from an African background and what, what I had been seeing from the arguments that the logistics company was throwing forward, I thought they were not going to let me climb. So I didn't want to get everyone excited here at home that he's gone to the Himalayas because he's heading off to Everest just in case things happen. So that's why Elizabeth really didn't know about that um, because when I, when I met her in person, we sat down and then she said to me, well, seriously, so you know that if you, if you summit Everest, you will not only be the first African or South African to do it, you will be the first black person in the entire world to do it. 
and I sort of smiled and I thought, well, sounds like a little bit of a title, but really, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, didn't think into me, you know, being first what it meant. And then I took, I sort of went up the mountain and I came back and there was the first this and first that. And it took me a long time to really want to sort of bring that up when I was talking to people. Um, because not that I didn't feel right about it, it didn't mean much to me, but there was a certain point in my life where it meant a lot. And then from that on, I mentioned it, because I've written about it, I've bragged about it, was when I was walking from the, the coast of Antarctica all the way to the South Pole, which we did over 1,100 kilometers, I was in the middle of this ice desert, and then suddenly I thought about Captain Scott and 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 Aman Sin, those yesteryear explorers. But when I was there, I felt like them. Only then did it dawn on me that civil so you are a pioneer. You are walking where none of your great grand ancestors walked. For you, you are like any other person who walked here as as the first to do that. And only I understood the meaning of being first because I realized that if you are first, this is now coming to that question um what's the meaning of it if you are first it means that you will never be substituted anyone else can follow and uh, they can be second third faster well, faster whatever but you as the first person to do things or anything um if it is history making then you will forever remain first so that was where the profoundness came from and that is where i felt very humble Thing saying, look at this young man who grew up in very rural South Africa, and I have firsts. And, and then suddenly I'm talking about countless firsts, which I never thought that would happen. So it's, it's quite remarkable and very humbling. But at the same time, it just makes me feel very proud to be an African and to be a citizen of the world, because I think there are many people out there who definitely or certainly want to be first. As I see every now and then, um, if People are finding like little things that can give them first, but you know, you know, they 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 really are hungry for first, and unfortunately, there are not that many left. So for me to be one of those people who are genuinely first is quite remarkable. It is amazing, and it just does humble me every time I think about. It. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for sharing. It is, um, they, there's always first this and first that uh, seems to be important. But I guess who remembers the second, they say, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> having said well, that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that, that's the point. That's the main thing, really, because nobody does. Um, I think um, it goes on to being people, it goes on to being the mountains that we climb. If you mentioned uh, any of the second highest mountains, people are like, what is that? Because the <laughs> one they know, they know Everest, and, and, before, and, and, and others that know Kilimanjaro, they say, oh, you climb, it, you climb that biggest mountain, Kilimanjaro. I'm like, yes, I climbed Kilimanjaro, but I've also climbed Everest, which is the <laughs> highest in the world. So nobody bothers who cares about who second, third, and, and, and whatever. That's why then being, being first, and those of us, I wouldn't say that we're fortunate enough, but we're lucky enough to be exposed at uh, such time that we would be first to, to achieve or to do things that other people of our race would not have even dreamed um, of doing, and then we became first. It's quite amazing. Because I, I remember very well, we, we used to sing about it you know, during our schooling days, the first person to to land on the moon was so-and-so, and then Edmund Hillary, the first person to summit. And it took a long time to realize that he was actually with Shepard Tenzing. I mean, when I realized I was, he was with Shepard Tenzing, it was many years later, but the first, always the first. So that is the sad reality of being people, unfortunately. Absolutely. And it's also the reality of who tells the story, who controls the narrative. I wrote an article about it, uh, you know, on, on social media to say, if you look at how the, the shapers now are going, summiting first winter summit of K2, everyone walks away from Everest and they go and summit. Um, you start wondering, like, who was really first then when we didn't have a view of what's happening on Everest? But I'm not going to go into that. I'm going to just go into Mr. Villane, the first black African man to summit Everest. There's often pressure to posture in a specific way once your success is in the limelight, 
you know, everybody wants a piece of you at one point or another. This happens to athletes as much as it happens to small businesses and emerging businesses uh, and business leaders. Has there ever been a time when you just pushed back and refused to associate with a narrative that did not suit your code or your ethics? Oh, well, I, I was very lucky that when, when I, I came into, into the limelight and, and my story came and sort of evolved in the country, um, the good thing was this, uh, this first of on a mountain wasn't anything that was known. And, and as such, it didn't bring the hype that it has brought for other people like yourselves and others that have followed near 15 years later. Um, because I mean, as for me, I still walk around Nellis Street, and don't, nobody knows who I am. I don't. I, I just sit in a, at a restaurant, and nobody has an idea uh, or come to me. Well, except some some people who are observant, and then they look at me, and then some will just come to me and say, "I, I seem you, you sort of you look familiar, but they can't even connect the dots or anything." So I was very lucky that way, and I didn't have to to push. Um, any agendas away or people that different different narratives to what I had. I was very fortunate in that way. But um, the the sort of group that I, I wanted to stay away from were, were those people that would just give you a very um, nice handshake and say you, you put us on the map and you made us proud. I'm like then yes. So but what are you going to do about it? And and. and <laughs> <laughs> because it, it was just that I'm like really is that all you can say I put you on the map and I've made you proud and that's it so it, it also helped me a lot because when I realized that it ended there because it was when people started asking me like years later um, I, I would say people would say did the government um, do something like build the house or give you a million rains <laughs> as, as other people about that in other countries and I would say to them, oh, well, yes, they recognized the fact that I had summited Everest and I had the chance opportunity of meeting um, the president, uh, which obviously gave you your very uh, kind, um, well done, and which is that, that handshake, well done, and you, you put us on the map and we are very proud of you. And that was only that. But I think the general public thought that there was something more than that. And I sound like, no, we don't. We, well, even people that come back with a couple of silver medals or even it's a bronze medal, I think they are much more celebrated, um, much more than we do as adventurers and as mountaineers. And that is the sad reality of it. So, but people think that it should be like that. I'm like, well, I don't know. So um, how are we going to influence that? But that, that somehow, the way it happened to me, it just happened and it was sort of a quiet thing and it just died down immediately. So I was never haunted really by, by anyone. I didn't have to hide. I go anywhere freely and peacefully. And I'm sure in your case, you can't. And no, no, no. They you just tend to, you tend to one corner like, no, that is Sarah. That is, that's, that's Sarah over there. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. You know, I don't want you to get away from, from this. You, you touched on something. It's not just any president. You were congratulated by President Mandela himself. That, that is just amazing. I think that is more than a million, the million rand based on what the man has done, Sibu Siso. But before yeah. you touch on that, I want you to talk about the flag that you planted um, on Everest. This is a story that you told me about it finding its way to parliament. How did that happen? How did that go, up, go about? <laughs> <laughs> that story of my flag on the summit of Everest. So, so, so let, let me share with people who will, who will listen to this, um, how, how what happened. So I, I carry this flag in my, in my pack and I had been given it by, it was the Minister of, was it Home Affairs or Foreign Affairs? Anyway, um, it, it was Minister Vali Musa. He came to the airport and gave me the flag. And I remember very well when I, when he walked into this little building where, where we were, where he was going to give me flag, the flag, he looked at me and said, well, I, I, when I heard that you were going to climb Everest, I thought you were one of these big guys and giants. And, and, and I said, well, um, 
Mr. Mr. Valley, I, I may be small in stature size, but I'm a giant inside. I will take this flag and I'll put it on the summit of Everest. And that's what I did. So I took the flag and when I when I got to, to know about the shepherds, their religion, and the fact that they leave prayer flags on the mountains, I sort of crafted this idea that I will take the, I will hold the flag, pose for the for the photograph, but then leave the flag on the summit among the shape of uh, prayer flags. So uh, my, my thing was, it will be praying for Africa on top of the world. For me, that was very, it was very profound. It was a personal agenda. And so that's what I did. We stood, stood on the summit, took the photograph, and then I uh, even attached it next to that little pillar that stands there, making sure that it didn't just blow away with me there or so. And, and then we walked down and, and it's there. But halfway down the mountain, I remember where I was on the lots of face, um, I came across a group of American climbers that were going to do a late summit. They were summiting on the 29th of May, the, the big day. And among them was another South African climber who was going up. And um, they said, hey, we have got one of you. Your countrymen here, I said, well, who's that? And then they mentioned him. So I said, well, good luck. Yeah, with, uh, I hope you would climb. You have a good climb. And then they said, congratulations. So I went down, no mention of the flag. I come back home. So the media is writing about the story. I get interviewed and nobody talks about what happened to your flag. And then about a week later, another journalist telephones me, says, well, civil so, so, um I just wanted to ask you this question. Do you know that? Another South African summited uh, three days after your summit. And I said, well, I've heard in the news. And then he says, well, he, he brought your flag down. What do you think about that? And I was just got smacked. I was like, damn struck. I couldn't say anything. I didn't really know what to say. And I almost asked, but why, why did he bring the flag down? And somehow I thought, well, maybe don't ask the journalist because he doesn't know. So I was like, oh, okay. Uh, well, I didn't know he brought the flag down, but so be it. And then it was just quiet like that. But two weeks later, um, we get invited to the Houses of Parliament. It was sort of a meet and greet and acknowledge the achievements. It was ourselves as summiteers and with a few other young kids who had achieved so much in science. It was just one of those days where the president just wants to acknowledge people. And it was the then President Abu Bakr. But on the aeroplane, which we had booked, been booked on the same flight with this guy, and as I walked past him, he greeted me, and then he says to me, well, I said, well, so do you know that I brought your flag down with me? I said, well, I heard. And he says, well, the reason I brought it down um, is because we were climbing Everest for charity, and I thought it could be auctioned to benefit the charity. So I said, well, okay, is that the case? But he says, I brought it with me. I've got it in, in my, with me, and I thought... I will I would hand it back to you um, when we meet the president. So I knew where the story was going anyway with that. I didn't mind. So I said, okay. Um, so I went down to my seat and next to me was the guy that was accompanying me. So I said, well, I've got this fellow who brought down my flag and he's told me he's going to give it to me at the, with the president. And, and then now he says he wants to auction it to benefit a charity. And this guy said, well, it is your flag and it is a national symbol. I don't think you can auction a national symbol. But it is your call. It is your call to do um, what you're going to do with it. Then I just kept quiet. So I crafted an idea. So when as soon as he gives me the, the flag, I will just present it to the president. And sure and below, and and and, and that's what happened. So the president met us. We were sitting at this a place where we had lunch. Then he started greeting us, and 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 then my brother said, "Mr. President, with me here is the flag that Sibu Siso put on the summit of Everest." And uh, I thought, cleverly, I thought I would uh, give it to you so that you can hand it back to him. But the president was so, so kind. He just took the flag and handed it back to me. And I know it was that moment of, let's take a photo with the president. And it's fine. But it's just, as soon as I had held it in my hands, I sort of remembered the emotions of having left it on the summit. And I said to me, the president, the president, I, I think this flag has a lot of history in it, but more than that, it's a, it's a national symbol that I, I, I would like to keep, but at the moment, I don't think I want to keep it. Therefore, I think it has to go to a museum because of the history that it has since made for the country. So I handed it back to the president, and the president kindly, you know, he all the time, kindly takes it, and he says, 
Oh, well, you didn't say anything. So you took it and we went to the House of Parliament. And then his opening statement was him holding the flag in his hand. He says, this is the flag that was taken to the summit of Everest by Silo So it has since been blown down by um, Sean. And and Silo Ciso has given it back to me. I will not going to keep it. I will give it to you, friend. And that was Dr. Friend Genuala, who was the Speaker of, of, of Parliament. Now it is it is in your hands. You, you know, you see you, you see what you do with it. And then Friend accepted the flag and took it. And that was that. Yeah. So I come back home and I sit and the year passes. So it's it's another opening of parliament. I'm thinking, I wonder where my flag is anyway, because if it is rotting in a cabinet somewhere. I would rather have it because for me it is very precious. I would rather have it. So I try and make contact with the people in power. What happened to my flag? They say, oh, your flag, your flag is well looked after because as you walk into the House of Parliament, it is mounted nicely just above on the wall. And we would like to have some photographs from you so that we can we can put. And a week later, that was when I, we were invited to the opening of Parliament. And I walked in there with the sole intent to just have a look if my flag was there and it was there and i remember i stopped behind and took a photograph of it so that's the story of that flag from the summit of mount everest it is such a, a hilarious story but amazing but yeah so wow. i'm glad that it is the way it is today yeah yeah wow well, that, that is amazing it's, it's such a beautiful story and uh, and and part of history i suppose for you as well as the country um it is, so and then the fact that it is there, and I, I hope that it would probably stay there. And, and, and there was a, I would like to just find out sort of, uh, what, what the inscription on it is, because I think I saw with the pictures of it, and it would be nice to see what, uh, what it reads, about yeah. that, because that's history. <laughs> Absolutely. So when did you first realize that you have the capacity to endure difficult conditions on the mountain? You know, conditions like the winds, um, you know, <laughs> your oxygen depleting. I remember part of it, you came down without oxygen. The waiting for the weather window. I mean, that's endurance. When did you realize that I actually can do this and I, I've got the patience to, um, to wait and, and go at the right time? I've got the endurance that's required in mountaineering. It's interesting because for me, I, I, I don't think I will, I, I will probably connect it or link it to, to the actual climb. Yeah. I, think, I think my life from when I was born was such that I was just enduring um, hardships. And, 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 in, and I, I believe that there are a lot of us in Africa, I think in, in a metaphoric time, you can say uh, you, we climb mountains and big ones every day. And, and, and that is what prepares us for any other mountain. In fact, when I, when I found myself at the base of the mountain, I looked, I looked back at my, into my life and I said, well, you know that you've climbed this mountain before. Um, the only thing that you had not done is that you've never physically, physically climbed it. And this is the time for you to do. So, so the hardship, if people are saying what hardship, hardship is he talking about? Because I think people look at me now and they think I've always been a well-off uh, individual, very privileged. No, I wasn't because my parents uh, got rid of each other when I was about three years old, much younger than that, me and my sister. For a few years, we were growing up, we were living with my grandmother who didn't even know how to look after two children. There were days we would have no food. We, ha we had no clothes to wear. That's why I ended up being asked by people to help them looking for uh, looking after boats and cattle. I've been at school and the result was that I wasn't in a school until the age of 10. And I remember that was the only time I would wear a pair of shoes, which was a it was a school uniform and I couldn't uh, last a day with a pair of shoes in my feet because I've been I've become so used to walking barefoot that it, it just frustrated me having to, to wear shoes but it just was just growing up through those desperate um, times and then I deciding to take my life um, into my hands when I reached 15 because that's when I sort of really decided that even my mother wasn't going to to be a person I was going to rely on. Um, she had her own issues as well. 
So, so realizing that you don't have a home and you don't have anywhere to live, um, but now you must because you are here on the planet. I had to make do with what I had and just try and fend for myself up until I walked out of high school and then straight into a working environment. And from the age of 22, I had I had worked grafting so so hard and and enduring hardships in between. So it, it was just those experiences that prepared me for any challenge, really. So when I got to Everest, the determination was such that there was nothing that was going to stand in my way because I knew what I needed to do to be able to get to the top. It was just to fight and be as resilient and didn't matter how many storms hit us, as long as the time still allowed us so that we could go, I was just going to be there. And when I remember very well that after all the rotations, we were sitting um, at base camp waiting for that weather window, which obviously somehow it opened. And like in any other years, our, our first one was short-lived because it was only for three days. We climbed up to Camp 2 and then there was so much heavy snowfall and we couldn't go up the lots of face. Sensibly, that move was called off. At first, you think, oh, it's okay, we'll be going down to base camp and just sit for a couple of days. And when you see a week and then 10 days later, you were still sitting, waiting patiently. And for me, it was then when I looked at it and I thought, well, here are so many people and none of us can do nothing, anything with the weather. Therefore, the only way we can still hold hopes of summiting was if we adapt and be flexible and to get to the, to get a chance and go to the mountain, which means then in that situation, you play the game according to what nature throws at you. And I realized that immediately. And that's why I, I then realized that I, I have the patience, I have the resilience. When people were leaving uh, base camp saying, no one will summit this mountain, and our leader said, no, uh, patience will repay those who wait. I just believed in him. And after our third attempt, we summited that mountain. But for me, uh, I, I won't, because I'd never been to, to such conditions. I've never experienced this physicality of um, being climbing in Everest or when you are sleeping in a tent when it is minus 15 or minus 20 or minus 30 for that matter. And the winds that threatened to kill us on the mountain, I'd never experienced all of those. And, and obviously, I just did not have any idea as to how long we were going to wait until that weather window. It just what overwhelmed me the most was the reason why I was there. And because of that, which was just to be there for Africa, because of that, then I just said, there's no way I was going to go down without a summit. But Everest just confirmed that th that is what it takes to reach the top and whatever top, your top as a person is you've got to be determined you've got to be resilient you've got to know that there will be times when you don't reach the top when you want to but with patience and and many many attempts you might reach the, the, the summit it was just a confirmation of what i had brought to the mountain that it said yeah that is what it takes and i just couldn't uh, uh take anything else other than that and in fact that's still what i share with people today mountain taught me a lot but it confirmed what i'd always thought oh it lent when i was growing up yeah do you think you know i mean you're talking about you being 15 that's a little too young uh and maybe not uh do you think it was you know there was something going on with you at the moment when you realized that hey um you know i'm made for this was it was it an emotional moment for you in your life was it a spiritual moment or it was like oh, I've got this. It's like, okay, this is me and I can do this. So, uh, well, so John, so I met John in 1990, 1996 and John and I start hiking together and we start, we start talking about mountains and he asks the question why there are not that many black climbers coming from Africa. So I say to him, look, we don't have the time to go to a wilderness area and just camp and and secondly i don't understand why people want to go and just rough it in a little tent and and then and then thirdly i said uh, i don't even understand why people would even pay to do us um so so i thought that was that the story had ended but john was very persistent so he brings up everest then he says well but having looked at you 
uh, because he's the one that triggered, triggered this whole thing. Looking at you with the same ability that I've seen in you, I believe that other Africans who share the same natural ability. But it, it, it makes me just wonder why Africans have never ventured into attempting Mount Everest, which was climbed in 1953 by Hillary. So I said to him, well, but that's a mountain overseas. And he said, yes. So I said, well, you realize that there's no African who can afford to buy a ticket to go overseas to climb a mountain because it won't make sense to my mother or grandmother or whoever is just bringing you, bringing you up and trying to bring food on the table. Why do you ask for money to go overseas to climb a mountain? So there was a, just like my, my, my African thinking mind, like, no, it would be near impossible. So when, when John says to me, if you had the resources and the means to climb Everest, now this is where this, this thing changes because he says if you had the resources, and he was talking about being, would, if you had the money and all the other material resources, would you climb Everest? And, and it, within me immediately, I realized that those were fine, but those were not the, the ones that were going to determine my decision on the mountain. It, it was... I needed to self-probe, look within me and, and introspect to say, do you have what it takes to do it? And then it was when I answered that question that, yes, I'm, I'm made for this. I can do this. And I said to him, yes. I didn't even say to him, well, wait, I'll just go home and think about it. At that moment, when I thought about it, I said to me, to myself, no, you've got this. And if you get the chance, then you might as well go. So, so that, was, that was the turning point. Um, I have what it takes to do it and that's the reason I said to John absolutely if I get a chance to do it I would then we went on and I did that but if it, I don't think it would have happened um, up until that moment when John mentioned it to me I don't think I would have searched within myself to see that do I have it or I don't and I think I would still feel very grateful and indebted to him that he is the one that turned on the switch and made me to think. And when I started thinking very deeply within seconds, that was the day I summited Everest when I said to him, absolutely, I have got what it takes to do it. I believe I can do it. Absolutely. Um, we're going to take a few minutes um, to give our sponsors um, uh, some time to tell us a little bit more about what they do. For now, grab a cup of coffee and drink a little bit until we get back. In a world of possibilities, our choices define who we are. We can choose to simply get things done but we choose to make a difference. We can choose to go far, or we can choose to go further. We choose great over good every time, because we can. And because we can, we must. We don't just act, we activate. When we move, we move forward. Instead of simply providing access, we see the potential for success. Because where others see data, we see dreams. To us, connecting means more than plugs and ports. We exist to empower ordinary people to do extraordinary things. We aim higher and we choose to do more. We don't wait for opportunities. We create them. Our choices define us. And when faced with the choice, we always choose. Extraordinary. to um, the conversation with Sibusi Sobilane, the first black man to summit Everest and complete the Explorer Grand Slam. This is the seven highest peaks on seven continents, skiing to the North Pole as well as to the South Pole. 
There is only 70 people in the world at the moment that have done so. What a privilege and an honor. Sibusiso, you are also an expedition leader in your own right. I mean, you, you've done over 27 or 27 um, Kilimanjaro expeditions with uh, taking people up. You've done Akankagua and you've done many other mountains um, around the world. But who would you say is the most important shaper in your life or the most important shaper on your journey um, to the success that you have or to where you are at the moment? Yeah, well, thanks. I have, I have the one. Well, I, I will share. I will share my two thousand and three climbing experience. Where on when when we on the summit attempt, each member got allocated a climbing shaper, and that was the only time you would feel connected to the one individual guy, and because he's your climbing shaper, and he is responsible for, in my opinion, for whatever happens to you. And some of them will even summit the mountain if you summit. So my climbing shepherd turned out in 2003. Uh, I, 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 I don't even remember his experience because uh, I was also a newbie in this game. So I never really bothered to sit, sit down and ask um, how experienced he was. I know one client from climbing shape and say no he's too old and i don't want him um he's not strong but i didn't look at those for me i accepted that i had a shape i would be a person with me and so this would almost be fire after the summit because what happened was we we summited it was quite early in the morning and then as we were coming down one of the climbers uh, lost his his eyesight which is very common and he couldn't see so the two leaders of the expeditions had to help him and he was sitting just above the hero step they had to help him so okay and you you feeling strong we don't want you to sit and, and run out of oxygen and get cold you must keep going so you go down with your sherpa so I said, so I said, thank you very much. And we started leading down. But then now I said to him, my friend, you, you need to look, walk in the front because you know the way. And he just looked at me like that. You know, he didn't, didn't understand what I was saying. Then I realized that I was wasting my own time and I just carried on. I had to find my way down. So in my first ever summit, I learned a lot and my shepherd didn't really help much. And in fact, I almost, um, lost the summit because he was lagging too far behind i remember before the hero step we i think was it said uh, the second step we had to change to um uh, to f a fresh oxygen bottles that were full which will take you to the summit there was the logistic around that and my michael my, my, he was carrying my own personal uh, oxygen extra one which was which is one of the things that you really um adore them for and you cherish them that they're there carrying an extra load for you but because he was lagging too far behind i had to wait and i was very lucky that i was still warm if it might have taken me 10 15 minutes of waiting which is in in, in that's a lot just but to me and we i switched and i took my oxygen tank and i went away in fact he summit didn't summit because it was that slow so i got to the top and then I only met him on the way down when he was given the instruction to look after me coming down, coming back to South Pole, which he didn't. So I left with the fact that you know some, you need to to be you know you need to connect with the old shepherd and see if he understands any word of English or some English so that you will be able to communicate with each other with each other or else know that oh my guy doesn't speak english that well so you know that you're on your own you can only have gesture with when you need things but i didn't understand all those so going back to everest and now this will answer your question in 2005 on my second climb on the northern side um we we had had a, fa a fabulous summit day but the night before we we, we were just surviving a big uh, windstorm um at camp three which is at about eight three on the on the north side it was higher much higher than the, the south core and um, and we did have, we had not uh, melted enough water we had not eaten enough because it was just near impossible to start a stove when your tent mate is lying down which was the case so we were not um, rehydrating quite well recipe for disaster anyway having learned my my 
previous from my previous experience that you don't want your climbing shaper to be too far behind. I stayed with him um, step by step, making sure that he was with me and I would check on him. And I realized that he was actually slower and slower and I see, I could see the gap between the other people in front of us who was opening up. And, and then I said to him, are you okay? But for a few seconds, he would say, yes, I'm fine. But I realized he was getting slower. And at one stage, I said on my third attempt, are you sure you're okay? And then he says, well, I don't feel like I'm getting enough oxygen from my, my, my tank. So I said, well, let us stop and have a look at it. And then we checked and I found that it wasn't uh, giving him enough flow. Luckily, he had a spare um, set up, a spare set. And we changed that into, into a fresher one. Then it was okay. By the time we finished working with that, all the other head torches had just disappeared over the hill. So it was me and him that night throughout up until the early morning hours and up to the summit. And then because we summited last, the first group when we got to the top was picture, picture. They were going down. We followed suit. When we get to the top camp, by that time I'd ran out of oxygen, uh, ran out of water, ran out of energy, ran out of ev everything. And I sort of sit into my tent, I crash in the tent, trying to rest, and I hear my teammates saying, hey, we are going down and they all leave, and I thought the shepherds were still there. And the next I hear my shepherd saying, hey, sister, sister, we, we need to go. But I, and then I said to him, but I asked for water, I haven't, I haven't seen, we haven't brought the water in like half an hour. He says, there's no water. And that was that. And so I started packing my bags and I walked outside, they were all gone. So I'm alone in the dead zone and I don't have a climbing shaper. I don't have food. I run out of water. I tried to stand and I couldn't, I couldn't stand. I was just so dehydrated. I was just dying, actually, if you're talking of Everest stems. In fact, I've got my photographs. When I look at that, I'm like, no, you were dead. I, you can just tell. My lips were blue. My eyes were blue. Everything. So I wasn't there. But anyway... Um, so I started fighting for my life because I remembered stories of telling the void, how, how, how Joe Simpson um, survived and, and he fought. Because when I looked at that movie, I realized that the reason he didn't accept dying in that void or in that little cave where he'd fallen is because he refused to die. So I said, I'm going to also refuse to die. If he calls me crawling on all fours, I would do it. And that's what I did. But later on the day, still slogging along, fighting to save my life. As a young shaper who was a climbing shaper for another South African climber who was in the dream. And he, they had now through via radio picked up, but I wasn't at the lower camp where I should have been. And I wasn't at the upper camp where I should have been. And then this young fellow was sent down to look after me, which was a perfect move because sending someone from the bottom would have taken them a hell of a long time. But someone coming from the top was going to be quick coming down. And they, so he came and I want to believe that he is the most important shaper in my life. And he has grown to be one of the well-known uh, shaper climbers in, 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 in Nepal now. But he, he saved my life. I think I'm here because of him. I don't know if I would have put all the way to camp. I was very determined. But, if he, but when he found me, then that is when it was, well, I got an assurance I was going to leave. And I think I owe it to him and the guy who sent him down that I'm here today. He will always remain the most important uh, Sherpa. He was the leader. He my, was my leader because, I mean, my, my, I, had, I had an expedition leader who had abandoned um, his really students on that day and uh, teammates who had forgotten have a teammate so it was as such but it was only that one man and the unselfishness of that guy to say i'm happy to go with my ship uh, i don't know how i was going to climb up without one but you know the universe conspired that one of the climbers turned back and he had two shapers and then the other one then was about to climb with the other guy so the whole thing ended up working quite well but um yeah that's the this, this, this critical uh, person on the mountain that Sherpa saved my life. Wow, that, that is an amazing story. Thank you for sharing. I think many times we, we don't talk about uh, climbers that are abandoned on the mountain uh, every now and again, and also climbers that also abandon their own Sherpas. It's, it's just, it gets crazy. I think if you remember 2014, I said, um, we don't stop 
being Abantu just because we are at high altitude. So let's go Ubuntu Everest. <laughs> I think it, it's just important to remain uh, humans. Um, but thank you for sharing that. So just going into the last segment of our discussion, uh, contextualizing Mr. Villani. You know, in 2008, you walked to the South Pole with, um, with Alex, I believe, and Edith. I think that's just not Black. Let's just start there. <laughs> you know, can you describe what the internal voices in your mind were saying to help you stay on course and keep going, pulling that sledge, you know, knowing that everything you have and that you need until the South Pole was behind you and within you? Well, 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 that expedition, that, that was the expedition, because I think people tend to ask me the question, which, which is hard, uh, South Pole or Everest? And uh, those that don't know where I also went to the North Pole, and I always say I can never compare. I'm the person who refuses to compare the two, because they are all different, totally. So we decided, I wouldn't say even young African, young South Africans and Africans, um, we, we, we were just excited that we explorers and adventurers that we would want to walk to the south pole but we do it the pr proper way uh, like captain scott and them even though we didn't go by ship to the ocean or to the coast we will get dropped off at the coast and then do it unsupported and unassisted meaning we're just pulling everything and we would work it out that would take us about 80 days and in distance we'll cover a distance of about 1100 kilometers because we were doing 10 degrees from 80 south going to 90 south and both of us had never been on skis i wasn't a skier alex wasn't a skier and now they're two blocks coming from africa different backgrounds and thinking that they will walk across antarctica on those metal ski uh, i call them metal plates uh, which were slippery and and so and and probably weighing sleds that were about 100 kilograms each and a when I, when I saw my one being loaded at, at, the, at the base where we started, I just wondered how, if I was, it was even going to move if I just tried to pull it. And when it moved, I was very excited. So that was the first thing. I was happy that, okay, I can, I can tell it moves because my sled weighed much more than I weigh. I was only about 65 kilograms anyway. So, so we start and we are excited about this because we were experimenting, if I can put it that way. We didn't know what we are doing. We are trying to see what we were work and and we knew that because we were doing it unsupported and unassisted there was no room for error there so our planning was such that if uh, we might run out of things but we can't run out of food we can't run out of fuel we can't run out of anything that would compel us to call someone to, to put drops or anything to drop offs and anything like that and we had done very well but 10 days into the into the expedition we were just hang, getting the hang of it another worst blizzard in the continent hits us and we sit in this little tent in an ice desert for probably about a week and we're going mad at each other because i'm saying to alex alex we should be going and alex is like no we don't want to be going in these conditions i said but we came prepared for these conditions we knew that this was going to be antarctica then it was going to be as such same so way he just remain steadfast now we, we are in two parts and i was so frustrated and um, such that every morning to show him that we could walk in the conditions i will i will eat breakfast and i would put on my skis and just walk outside for night 30 minutes in the place and then come back and like see we could have gone further a little bit even if it was only for another kilometer or so um so that's how frustrating it was but the challenge with that was you are sitting in a tent you are losing um, the distance and you're losing time because there was also a time frame. Time frame. It wasn't like it would be there forever. It's seasonal. And anyway, the weather cleared. We start going. And when we start going, now we see the best of Antarctica when it comes to weather because every day it was one blizzard after another blizzard after another blizzard. And there's so much pile of snow that we were just rafting along. Sleds would sit and not move. And it was there that you kind of think, hmm, but why in the first place am I here? You know, what, what, why am I in this place? And why am I uh, sort of punishing myself doing this thing? And then you realize that, you know what, you've committed 
almost a year of planning and training and and the resources that have been put to get this um, uh, are so much that you can't just go back now and say you can't do this. So you just push yourself. So, but there was a lot that was happening. And then when we would got to about halfway, when I left home, with, for me, that was, because it turned out, it, it turned out to be one of the most emotionally draining expedition. When I left home, my last boy was only about a year old. And, well, only civil so can live a year old and go to a four months expedition. Um, no one else will do that. But people, I always believe that there's, it's an opportunity and, and timing is of the essence. And you can push it to the next year, but it won't happen. For me, it had to happen that I leave my daughter with her mother. She was about six months old, size. And she had been uh, sort of semi-diagnosed with child's asthma. She could not breathe. And, and then when we start, I made it. I uh, set a telephone call home and they said she was getting worse. So from the start up until to halfway, um, I was in two worlds. Uh, part of my life was here at home. Part of it I was in, the, in there. So it was very, it was agonizingly tough. When we had to sit down, I hated it because all I wanted to do was just to move to the south. Giving up wasn't an option and abandoning the expedition just for the sake of a sick daughter wasn't in my head. I wanted to, every time... I would call home and find that she was still breathing. She was with them. And I said, okay, I would have another day in Antarctica. And that is what happened. But when we were just being ravaged for the eight hours in the storms, uh, it, was very, it was very difficult to really try and comprehend the mindset that makes a person stay and endure such uh, but both of us had such resilience. We, we, had to fall, we had to fight through the storms. And it wasn't just one storm, um, all the way from the start up to the very end. Um, and I remember when we were about three degrees, about 87 degrees south, um, we, we got pinned down in a storm. And I said to Alex, there's no way we are sitting another storm because we need to go. And he was like, I, I hope we are not just... I was messing up the whole thing after after having endured so much. So it was that s stage where it was touch and go. Maybe we go, and then we mess up the whole thing, or we we sit, and then the whole the whole expedition would just fail as a result of that. But um, I think at the end, what kept us going and what got us um, to the South Pole was realizing that it is important to argue, it is important to disagree, um, but it is also very important to be aware that all your, your differences and, 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 and arguments uh, are leading to a way forward. And that I think ours ended up leading us forward every time. And then eventually we, we got to the South Pole. But it's an expedition that will remain as one of the toughest for me mentally. I wasn't physically drained by it because I still say today, it never stretched me to the fullest of my physical ability. Alex felt that it was physically tormenting for him. For me, it was just a mental um, torment, particularly being be between the two worlds, being at home and being there. It was very tough to take. But we did it. And again, it, it wasn't... I, th I don't think it, it, it becomes an adventure if it does not humble you um, at the end. Um, that's, that's why... So I will not just end it like that. <laughs> You're absolutely right. I'm, I'm laughing because we, we, I didn't do uh, as much as you did. I just did the, the last degree. And I got there. I, I must be honest, I don't think I trained as much as I did for Everest. I was like, I've done Everest. How tough can this be? Flip. It was never rest. Yes, it's not Everest. It's just never rest. Crazy, crazy. Yeah winds that are unpredictable, temperatures just change on you, and there's no rock to hide, you know? <laughs> it's like, no. Yeah, it's the no. craziest thing I've ever done. So I'm looking forward to the North Pole. Oh, no, absolutely. I don't, I don't know that we sit at home and whether we talk with friends or we read a book, and then you suddenly think, hmm, what a clever idea. And I know who sold <laughs> you told me into it was Ronald Fines and I remember very well when when his wife um Jeannie like Jeannie said that uh, because I was still going to Everest and she said Sibu Cesar I know you're still young you might want to do other stuff after Everest and he says if there's anything I can highly recommend you do is one of the polar walks which Ronald has done and I'm looking at Ronald Fines struggling holding a fork and knife because he's lost his digits from from one of the of, he was in the Arctic and I remember my heart saying 
Thanks, Junie, but no. And I don't know how it changed. That's the problem. When people plant the seed, then it just grows because that's that. And I remember that first instant, I'm like, no, I don't think I'll go there. And now we are talking about having been there, done it. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. It's crazy. Absolutely. Never say never, they say. <laughs> Anyway, so you, you, you've got rituals, I'm assuming, you know, that you do in preparation for a climb. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about that? And how is it different when you're preparing to lead a climb as opposed to you yourself having um, to prepare yourself for a climb? Any difference at all? Or is it the same? And if so, what are those rituals that you follow? Yes, um, thanks. When... When, 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 when it is an expedition about, about myself, about me wanting to go and climb a mountain, so the focus is on me. The focus is on me on am I, am I physically prepared for the, uh, for the challenge and am I mentally prepared for the challenge? And my, mental, my physical preparation is for me, it's, it is always uh, running because I run and I will rarely go to the gym now. Nowadays that you read, you need to uh, strengthen your core muscles and you, you might so I feel it takes some time to go. But I think I can count one, two, three, number of times I've been to the gym. So I run and naturally I've always done that. That's what I give um, in when it comes to my physical ability. And, and then mentally I would, um, I read a lot uh, of uh, real stories. And I don't, I'm not a, a, a fan of the movies. Uh, I will watch one when it is still new or coming up, but I just read about yesteryear stories and, and books and, and relate to people who have been on the expedition, even if it wasn't the one that I go to. And I think the best part that prepares my mind as a ritual is the story, the horror stories, the parts where either people are trapped in a storm and they survive or others survive, others perish. Um, I think once I understand that that is what happens and I accept in my head that that is what might happen, that is what I might experience. And if the yearning is still there to want to go, then I feel that I'm, I am prepared for that. So that is about me. Um, when I lead expeditions, then, then the whole thing changes for me. Um, I, I, I will still make sure that physically I am able, I'm strong I'm both physically and mentally, but my main focus becomes the people that I'm leading. Um, and and then even if, the, even if the, 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 on the mountain, I don't even find myself thinking too much about the mountain. And, and as such, when I introduce myself to the people, when they say, ah, see, see, so this one must be, it, it must be easier for you. I say, no, because I'm not, that mountain is not mine. You are my mountain. You see, so, so you are my challenge. Um, and, and that's how I lead expeditions. I take my way out of the picture. I don't exist. And, and I let the people exist. And that has helped me a lot to lead the way I have led uh, because I just don't personalize an expedition. Uh, I know I've got a huge responsibility and the biggest responsibility for me comes in two, in two, in two parts. It is their safety and, and the fact that, and helping them to achieve what I've set out to achieve. When I achieve those two, then, then I'm, I'm fine. So those are the only two things that I change. Because my expedition is about me. But if I lead, it is about the people I lead. Yeah, yeah. They become your mountain. That's interesting. They become, they, they become, my, they become my mountain. And, um, and it has, it has, it has uh, helped me a lot. In fact, it has, helped, it has made me to recognize the different shade between a guide and a leader, um, the way I do it. Because I think, I think a guide is a person who will walk across the way and be that side. Sometimes he's about 50 meters or 100 meters away, and then he wants you to follow. The way I lead is I am here, and I show you this is how it's done, and I'm with the person. If, if it gets to a stage where I need to hold them because it's the, it's the rocky section, and I can see that they're freaking out, I'm there. But when I'm with the guys, I can just see the guys just watch. So I'm like, okay, well, there's a difference between leading and guiding. So we, we, we don't guide, we lead. When you, when, you, when you lead, you have the person's interest at heart. Whereas when you guide, you just have, you have your own interest. You just want to show them, okay, this is the path over there. I'm like, no, but how do I cross the river here? For me, I would go there and say, okay, on that rock or that one, 
or and then you go you see how i've done it you can do it then i watch then if they are not comfortable then i assist i've never seen it i've never seen guides do that and all the guys that I, I i work with i try and instill that culture of leadership as opposed to guide yeah so so when you climb mountains it is i've experienced that you come down a totally different person more times than than not um almost like you go through a rite of passage of some sort right how would you describe your relationship with a mountain maybe your relationship with everest per se after three attempts or at two summits of yes. okay um, yeah yes um my relationship with um it started with with everest because i remember where i was start on kilimanjaro which i climbed in 1999 August of 1999 and I went on Kilimanjaro even though I was 29 years old I think my my my, my determination was just start at the bottom and and just race up to the summit get to the top and then walk out and go home so I didn't immerse myself um onto the mountain even though it just got me sick I didn't even think it was the mountain just teaching me lessons about mountains so I walked away and like that anyway so I go to Everest and and immediately i remember i remember very well i think you and i have got a picture of us sitting at that everest view lodge with everest in our background when it was as you can see and see it from there i was there um it was uh, pre everest october 2002 we just went up to to see that and i saw everest and there was one th- one thing that happened the feeling with me about everest immediately was that there was such there was energy on that mountain and the energy was such that it was a calm energy for me to be able to come and climb it and stand at the summit so from that everest view point i saw myself at the top it was october 2002 so i worked i, w- I walked back w- with exactly that energy and that feeling and that mental picture of me standing at the summit i came home we prepared the last preparations and i went up to everest and then i climbed and every time i looked at everest i felt like she was calling me there was that energy there was no no you are welcome you are welcome you are welcome until i got to the top i suddenly and then i walk away and from that day the the the, the relationship i have with mountains is such that they 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 talk to me um they communicate with me they have this amazing energy which i've also felt and have seen that it can come in two parts it's an energy that can break you or it's an energy that can make you uh or empower you if you put it that way and and i say it from experiences as well where with my own humbleness i've come to the mountain respect of that energy respect of the fact that i'm not i'm not just climbing the mountain the mountain is allowing me the opportunity to be there and if they didn't want me to be there they would either kill me or i would just get sick and not summit the mountain so those are the things that i have but most of all is what i have seen them do to other people who come with egos like i will run up the mountain i've seen a few of my brothers who came with that and they sort of ran up halfway and then the next time i saw them being carried down by a tiny shape in a little basket and i'm like <laughs> that is what the mountain has that yeah. so that for for me that's the relationship i have i've developed and i've grown even if I'm, it doesn't even have to be ever i think even the drug and spec when i'm there i just can just feel the connection you must me and mountains are one because of the the, the power and that's in them so that's why i go to mountains i feel re-energized refreshed i feel at peace and i will go there anytime it is just for that energy it is positive energy that they give me i don't know maybe other people they the mountains give them negative energy but for me it's positivity absolutely we almost done but i just want to reflect on where we are in the world today you know the last year has compelled humanity to endure extreme life changes because of covid-19 we in south africa are compelled to endure a very slow vaccine rollout as you know right if you were to give a pep talk about how to endure these times what would you say from a mountaineer's perspective and the learnings that you've had well the, the first of all we should all understand that 
life is about overcoming tough times. And I think most of us tend to have this notion that life should be plain sailing. It should be easier. Um, no. Um, in my view, life has to have these times of uncertainty. And particularly now during COVID, I think it was just a reminder to us because um, I believe that many a times we human beings think and believe that we, we are in control and we are superior and, 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 and nothing can, can come and just distract us except ourselves. But there are outside elements that have more power than us. And, and the only way for us to endure such is to recognize with the fact that life is as such. It requires to do that. But we just need to be prepared for either good or bad times. And, and, and we should know that it's, 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 it, is, it is seasonal. We, if you have had um, a great time of flats, then you definitely will either have times of downs or times of up. And, and it's a natural phenomenon and, and philosophy. We can't, we can't change that. But I think humanity needs to, to, to be very resilient. Um, and it is a choice, really. um, and it is for me. It's, it's okay to look at the government and, and, and expect them to to deliver these services, to deliver all these things that we want. But at the same time, human beings should understand that they have a responsibility to themselves. It doesn't feel like we individually feel that we have a responsibility. I mean, even now when we are told to to adhere to the regulations and things, there are people that you see outside there and realize that. There is no taking responsibility of this thing at all because we are doing it for the president and we are doing it for, for, for the, the, the COVID-19 um, committee or, and, and anything like that. If we do that, then it would be impossible for us to endure such, these hardships and we get frustrated and we become too emotional about it and some of us are already depressed uh, because we are, we are not used to it. I think over time, humanity needs to be shaken a little bit by events like COVID-19. And I think that is that is how, because I don't believe that um, resilience is built through is resilience is, is, is built through hardships. In fact, yesterday I was reminded of that because um, I, I was running this virtual comrade and I got to a stage where my house was a hundred meters away and, and I only, I had 30 kilometers to go and I was just hobbling along tired and I felt like, you physically you are not resilient anymore. But what made me to pass my house and run the, the thirty kilometers was resilience. If happened, if um, if I was just always done easier stuff, it's easy to quit. So uh, even even in any situation, uh, in my opinion, we need to be tested uh, to be resilient. And this was a good one. And we should always expect tests like this. Then, if we do that, we will be able to just endure that hardship and, and just move, move on with life instead of sitting and whining and complaining about it. Absolutely. And, and the last question is describe your best failure and how did it propel you forward? How did you use it to your advantage? It, it, it's a very interesting, uh, my, my first failure. Can I think of uh, my first failure? <laughs> Where have I failed? Like, like the first? I, I don't, I don't, I, I, can't, I can't think of any actually. What do I say? I need a moment to reflect on this one. Oh, yeah, well, may, maybe, if I, I think, I think, if, oh, yes. Um, if I was to look into my, into my family, into my life and, and, and my family, and um, one of the things where where I feel I have failed dismally as but it wasn't a failure as per se. It was because you know this notion of I grew up very poorly and um I don't want my children to, to grow up like I did. And then you sort of you tend to take away pretty much most of the stuff that made you who you are, that made you to be as resilient and to be determined. And, and, and that, that's the failure that I, I, I have had because I think in a way, um, I talk about imposing limitations. I think that's what we do to our children. And I've done that to my children uh, because I thought that they would look up to me and say, ah, if my dad can climb Everest, so can I. 
but it's it's okay to have that mentality but the question of do you physically uh, think you can do that and that never exposed my children to such so because i've been very i've been overprotective and and if I, I used to walk 10 kilometers one way from school and they can't even walk one kilometer to their school because they are driven and dropped off there and then picked up and then brought home and it's a distance that they could run within less than five minutes and then be there so i've done that i think that's where i've had this money. and unfortunately i've not been able to to sort of fix it so when they go we look at them as soon as they're again like that as sport as these ones are I would take them to the and try and walk with them, even if they're not having lots of jobs, but just walk with them and then tell them to walk to and from school as long as it is safe and, and send them to the shop. My children don't go to the grocery store, which is only about 300 meters, because I was like, okay, uh, over time, if there was something, I'll just go there and do it myself. And now they, they are spoiled. And, and when I look at them, I'm like, they can't cope. They can't cope with the, the little things. I think, as I was saying, greed can only be developed through hardship. And if you don't expose them to some type of hardship, you are letting them down. And as such, I failed. That is my only failure I can look at, which if I look at it, I just regret it. Actually. Like, why did you do it? But it was just the way I was brought up. And I'm not going to bring up my children. My children have a choice. I don't want, oh, well, I'll do today. This evening, I won't. I won't eat the beef. I want to eat the chicken. We had no choice. You only ate what your mother cooked, and we had no arguments. So, all those little things. No, no, I failed this one in that, in that part. Thank you so much, Subasisa. This was this was fun, and I really appreciate your your time. Um, and thank you to listeners and viewers. That was the first black man to summit Everest and complete the um, Explorer Grand Slam. They say we are all uniquely extraordinary and being ordinary is a choice, as you can see. We need to build grit. We need to keep going because the sky is indeed not the limit. That was Sibosiso Velani and I am Sarah Kumalo and this is Because It's There. Mm -hmm.